Hello, and welcome to Reflections. I am Rom Gayoso, your host. First and foremost, thank you so very much for your being here with me and my guests. Uh, I know your time is very important. I am the guy who will make sure it is invested wisely. So today, we have two very smart people, and I'm sure it will be a fun show. Okay, well, everybody's got some rules, right? So before I get started with the show proper, I need to cover some ground rules. So let me pull them up. Okay, those are the rules. Well, uh, we broadcast over a variety of different channels, and they have slightly different rules concerning the use of chat. Since we make a lot of use of chat, we need to pay close attention to those requirements. Basically, the rules can be summarized as follows. Be nice, be polite, be courteous. There's just only one golden rule. There is absolutely no hate speech allowed. By the way, the chat boxes are indeed open. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat or the chat box or the chat window, depending on the service you are using. Please do say hi and let me know where you're watching from. For our podcast listeners, please drop a comment on YouTube and I will make sure to say hi as well. I do have a very special favor to ask. Since there are several chat windows running at the same time, it saves me a lot of time. If you can please type hashtag ask, that is hashtag A S K in front of your question. This way, when I'm scrolling through the chat, ah, I can immediately spot your question and pose it to the guests. There are several ways for you to submit a question. Of course, you can use the chat if you're online and live with us. You can also email me a question. Please email it to editor at imcimagazine.com. If you prefer to use the talk to text function, just text your question to 001 for the United States, 480 Five four four eight three seven two. While privacy rules do apply, I will not save your text or your number. Once it is read, it is deleted. Okay, so let's move on to our first order of business today. And this is indeed uh, the agenda. So first, we're going to go over a brief introduction then I'm going to introduce the first guest, Mahesh Kao. He's the CEO of MR Accuracy Reports. Then I'm going to welcome the other guest, Fuad Benyub. He is a director of strategy at Everbridge, but today we are only going to talk about his book. You have plenty of time to ask questions during the show, but for any reason, if you have that last minute burning question towards the end of the show, I set a time some extra time for us to talk about Q's and A's or more comments, uh, anything you would like to. And of course, you can always use the chat or leave comments on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and I will go back, read through them, and make sure I post them. Okay. And then towards the end of the show, we're going to talk about upcoming events so you know uh, what to expect next. All righty, let's do our introduction. Okay, so Reflections, this show, we are the podcast and live stream partner of IMCI Magazine. You can find us online at www.imcimagazine.com. We are a publication in the United States under registry to 769-0008. We are a member of Edelweiss America Media, and our focus is on intelligence, competitive intelligence, market intelligence, economic intelligence, 
economic warfare, and a good chunk of the magazine is dedicated to both foresight and future studies. Now, our vision, uh, the reason why we exist, is to bring diverse perspectives and voices to the debate. I really think it enriches the dialogue when we hear different voices. Now, I would like to say a few words about the topic of the show today. Market research and intelligence are integral parts of the topics presented in the magazine. And today, we have two experts who will be helping us understand those topics a little better. They are very accomplished professionals and very senior in their organizations. We're really privileged to welcome them today. In addition to running a research house, Mahesh does a lot of work in intelligence. And for that matter, so does Fuad. Though today, I promised I was going to talk about his book, which has a lot of insights, by the way. Oh, yes. On the right-hand side, you can see the front cover of our current issue. And this time, we're focusing on sensing. So Mahesh is the CEO of MR Accuracy Reports, uh, based in the UK. His firm offers a variety of market-related research and consulting services. Uh, his firm can help you make sense of uh, what's going on in specific markets, you know, produce what matrices, profiles, industry-specific analysis, in addition to market sizing, forecasts, technology trends, and competitive intelligence. His reports cover a variety of industries such as IT, telecom, semiconductors, pharma, and manufacturing. So aside from work, he loves football, music, and traveling. So uh, Mahesh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Good to have you here. Same here. Okay. So um, before I get started, and I'm really not sure I'll get it right, but if I don't, please don't be upset with me, okay? So Arsenal or Manchester United? I think Manchester United. Okay. <laughs> nope, no problem. I said uh, I had a 50-50 chance of guess over there. I know, I know exactly. Because, okay. of course, I live in London, so for me, it's, it's always closer to me. And, of course, I, I've been a big fan of Manchester United. So I, I, I was going to say, she's going to say Arsenal, but let me try Manchester United <laughs> just in case I'm off, you know. Okay. I know, I know. Okay, favorite band of all times? Wow, I would say Take That. That's one of the old... UK classic old band take that Robbie Williams. I can't, you know, but that one of the that's that's one of my favorite favorite band. Okay, I have to make a note of that. I have to go check them out. Okay, take that. You you should check check it out. You know, because once I was there, out of hundred thousands, so eighty thousand only women were there. So they are big fan of Robbie Williams from Take That. Okay, please put that on. Drop that on the chat so everybody else and their mothers, if they care to, they can know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. favorite place to visit. Wow, uh, I would say Malaga. Okay, in why, Spain. why is that special? Because uh, I really like the beauty of the Malaga, and they have like nice beaches and mountains. It's a, it's not just like beach and mountain. It's a sort of blending of that. And he, because I've been to a lot of countries all around the world, but the Malaga is one of the place really, uh, really give me that impression that this is the place maybe in the future I might settle down in Malaga. Yeah. Wonderful. Hey, we all have that favorite spot in the world that uh, I know. Uh, we want to go to, right? Okay. So uh, let me get started with the first question. And, you know, I, I, we can't escape that really, the issue of the pandemic, right? So um, for most market research companies, uh, what have been the impacts? So uh, the impacts of the pandemic on you guys? Yeah, so far, of course, you know, the pandemic took a big toll on each and every industry, well, especially on the market industry. Uh, the first thing I would say, you know, uh, the changes in consumer behavior, challenges to data and research collection, uh, increasing digitization, uh, automation, and the market research shift to the mobile. These are the major impacts we have been observed. We have been fortunate or unfortunate we have been able to absorb this impact on the market industry. So, yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk about, you know, going forward, you know, the life in this post-pandemic world, 
So what will the market research market be or how will it be different from what it is today? Yeah, well, that's a really good question, right? That, because you know, right from the consumer behavior, we did survey a lot. So 45% consumer, consumer, they have changed their brand preferences. So you can just imagine how it has been impacted a big time to the people and the consumer behavior. And right, and if I talk about the data, right, the Google is going to remove their third party cookies from the, its own browser on 22nd of January, 2020. And on the top of that, there's another example to improve consumer policy and mitigate access data access uh, collection. Apple now uses uh, Apple now going to use an opt-in, I would say opt-in consent to identify uh, for the advertising, which is IDFA. So it means so that app iOS user they will now they can choose whether allowed to the IDFA and collect it or spread across the different different apps. And automation, of course. It's gonna be you know the repetitive uh, picking surveys all the time, analyzing data. It's gonna be fully automated, okay? And artificial intelligence and machine machine learning, it can it can easily process a large amount of data. Going further, the shift of the mobile as mobile uh, traffic continue to rise across the world, the market research industry must take an advantage of this. Uh, landscape to provide another medium to uh, extract consumer data. So these are the main uh, differences or changes we can see going forward post pandemic. Okay, wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about the risk profile. So how how do you see the risk profile today? What are what kind of risks do you see? Uh, well, uh, from market research point of view. Uh, there are two risks at this point of time. The first is uh, Google updates, because recently the Google found out that a lot of spamming has been happening. So research is now, now even for the market research companies as, as well as the provider, they are really penalizing their English websites and each and every day they're removing the English content. Uh, so, so the Google update has to be so now the provider has to make sure they got to come up with the unique content, otherwise they will just uh, run out of their competition. And the second thing is quality, because when it comes down to quality, the you know I'll just give an example: oil and gas, the rates, prices, it's, it it has been fluctuated all the time. So for our research team, it it, it becomes so quite difficult to get the accuracy and impeccable data. So. Uh, so, so for that, you know, we have come up with a different different strategies. So then we know, okay, uh, we can get the accurate data. So these are the risks over there right now. Okay, uh, we have a couple of uh, comments and questions uh, uh, for the audience. Uh, first of all, we have a, a, a Chelsea fan here. So Daniel is saying, well, I'm not so sure about Arsenal or Manchester United either. So, uh, okay, Daniel, well, I'll add that to the list. <laughs> so uh, I do have a, a different question for you. So uh, we talk about, the, you know, what's new, what's changed, the risk profile. So this comment is a little bit different. So uh, do you feel that the market research companies in general, they have failed to predict the duration of the pandemic and the requirements for a post-pandemic demand for goods in general? So did, did we not put enough calories into understanding what the, the next will be or uh, we just ignored it? So do you think we failed or how can we fix that? Well, you know, well, I will come back to the researchers because so there are different different ways. So some of the competitors, I would say, they must have been failed to predict the right future because our research team they should know if, if whether they should go for the primary research or secondary, or quality, quantity, triangular, top, polar, top, on, top, bottom, or bottom up approach. So there are different different approaches. So in order to get the predicted or the accurate data. So individual researcher, respective research team, they should know whether they should on focus on particular strategy, particular research. Hence, there must have been a lack of accurate research. But then, it's always it's always dicey, you know, because we give ninety percent accuracy of the reports. But then, you know, of course, as I said, I guess it can fluctuate. But then we always make sure we give ninety five to ninety six percent of accuracy to the client, so then they can make the business decision in a better way. Actually, that's a very good point. So, uh, so what happened? Probably you had a lot of, you know, turn out a lot of uh, extra work because you had your analysis right, and then pandemic happens, right? 
So, and you have, I don't know, thousands of reports. So what do you do? You, do? you stop what you're doing and you went back and rewrote all of them. So how was life? Was it hectic, crazy? What? How was your daily life during the, the onset? Well, it's getting really crazy, but of course we don't go to the back. So where we have worked. Mm. So then it, it, we really analyze the situation. Then we do, uh, then in that case, AI and, and, and ML, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in the picture and also big data because the big data will help us to collect and store data and analyze the data with no time. Hence, so so, so, so right now, each and every market industry, they should adopt the cutting edge technology in order to stay ahead of the game. And always adapting new technology, it's always the best. Okay, um, so uh, we, we tend to focus our attention uh, too much on the established markets, right? So uh, again, it's along the same lines of the risk profile, you know, whether or not we missed the boat, whether or not we realize things. So what kind of trends do you see now in the emerging market? So let's move from established to emerging, emerging market. Emerging. Wow, you know, that's one of the really, really good questions. So trends, so uh, I will tell you, uh, artificial intelligence can really dominate the consumer engagement. That's the first thing. The second thing I will definitely tell you uh, again, artificial intelligence, they are unable to help get the accurate data within no time. And on the top of, and along with the trends, I will definitely talk about the transition of the market research industry from to, because the back in days, if I tell you, data is scarce and expensive, but right now it's, it's going from from to data is plentiful and cheap, okay? The second thing I will tell you, uh, earlier the researchers, they were focusing on uh, attitude and opinion, but right now it's no more. We are focusing on we are we are focusing on two consumer behavior. Then again, it's from uh, asking questions earlier back in days. So if you see the trend right now, we are more into listening and observing to get the data. Okay, again from analyzing a single set of data. The earlier back in days we used to do that, but now that's not happening. Now we are synthesizing on multiple measures. Again, market researchers at the stage back in days, when it comes to stage, it means analyzing and gathering all the data or the information. But now it's more or less from to see the transition is a DIY data, which is doing to yourself within no time. Okay. And even earlier, if you'll see the people are collecting and uh, reporting of the facts. But right now, if you'll see the transition again, they are more into storytelling in the context of client business. So along with the trends, you know, you have big data, artificial intelligence, then uh, machine learning. And it has been really, really moving from to uh, along with the trends, the transition, it's happening at the same time. So which is really, really, I'm really intrigued in terms of the future. Yeah. Okay. So I want to remain on, on that note about technology, use of technology. So um, Harish uh, from LinkedIn, he has a question for you. He wants to know how AI will impact research industry in coming days. So what is the impact of AI in the industry on now and going forward? Because AI will enable faster analytics and uh, in terms of report creation, because the AI is might replace human, but not really. Because I will tell you, uh, there's a reason. Okay, now Google they have just come up with the sensor booster technology, right? Recently, so the Google boss would know really if it's a human. When when the research team they are doing survey, okay, uh, the sensor booster technology of Google they would know if whether it's a human or if it's a robot. If if the mobile is moving, the technology would know it's a human or not. So AI is going to play a vital role in the upcoming market research industry. And now even have uh, the robots that talk and now uh, they have one that wanders around and says things and responds to you. And well, apparently uh, uh, th this is the way to go. I, I, I don't know. So, well, on, on that note, uh, I want to uh, change topics a little bit. So talking about the future, right? So uh, what do you see in the future of market research? How will things be different? I mean, aside, not the post pandemic, but how will things be different uh, going forward? The future of market research industry is full of challenges and opportunity. Again, coming back to cutting edge technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning will enable faster 
analytics and report creation, big data enable access to collect, store, and analyze data in real time. Transparency is going to play in the big picture because right now the research team and client, they're gonna have clear transparency and client also would know how the data has been collected, it has been collected, and then they can trust the process. And also the partnership is going to be uh, a really important, significant role between, again, the uh, researcher and client. And then researchers comes in the picture at the early stage of the project. So then, so this is the future it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna get really smaller and the transference and partnership is gonna get bigger in order to take the future ahead and to get the trust of the client. Wonderful. So you said, you know, full of opportunities and full of challenges, right? So you mentioned challenges. So how, how do you go about managing them? Can you talk a little bit about those challenges and, and how do we manage them? How will we manage them? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, so there are a couple of challenges. The first thing I would say, existing market research methodology. Overwhelming of data, it makes very difficult to stand out from the noise because there are 500 websites are being added to Google. And then that's the reason it's, it's really one of the challenges for the market research industry. Okay, the second thing I will tell you, the quality. Uh, sometimes, like back in days, you know, the data that are being collected manually, which leads to poor research quality, and the client might get disappointed. What they were expecting, you know, up to level, and then they got to go back to scratch. So that's how it's, it, it, it has been happening. Secondly, research outcomes. So when it comes to research outcomes, expectation of clients are increasing due to complex business dynamics. Okay, so insightful strategic insights has to be provided stimulated timelines and that is again one of the becoming challenges which is happening across the globe for the market research companies that's the second thing the differentiating differentiated uh, team or from your competitors because what's been happening you gotta be uh, to demonstrate unique value okay that's the first thing and then novel contribution in the market research approaches there are the, the market research company they are following standard practices and everyone is following that and none of the people that are getting the clients when they are really pursuing them so with the advent of big advent and analytics market research company they can really stay ahead of the game and market research company they should adopt the cutting edge technology uh if they were uh, if they were really going on stand out of the competition so that's that's one of them they, they can do that and the second thing and then the fifth thing i will tell you the client constraint with ever increasing competition for the client needs to know the latest up-to-date information of the market research industry so a company should give them accurate agile impeccable data within no time and of course the client has their budget their timeline uh, then they have the scope of work is we involved, which is SOW. So we gotta get that everything in a bundle within no time. So that's one of the challenges out there. And the solution I can tell you, the market researchers they should really focusing on strategic insights from the data extracted, which would help clients to make business to make a business uh, decision in a better way. That's the first thing, and it can uh, they can really easily differentiate themselves from the competition by providing faster, accurate, and more insightful information about their clients. So these are the challenges and solution, if I put it in a nutshell. Wonderful. So I want to change topics a little bit. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, so when you're hiring researchers, right, what are you looking for? Uh, in other words, what are the desirable traits of a good researcher? What a good researcher oh. looks like. Oh, wow, that's really a good good question, Ron. You know, because it's really challenging to get the right candidate for any company. But then, when we look at the people, because we get CVs uh, across the globe, right from US, APAC region, Asia. But then the, we we look for the we don't we do not look great marks experiences. But then definitely we look for the challenges what they have faced and how did they solve it. Because the one can pretend to, okay, I have solved this and this is how it, but, but then he, he can go till certain limit, but he can't go beyond that. 
But then if the person had genuinely solved the problem and how did he overcome that obstacle, and he can really, and once when, when I personally, when I go in details, that person can tell me, okay, he has done that, he has done that, and then we know that person is genuine. So the main for me, the major trait is challenges. How did they challenge, how did they solve that challenge? And what's your plan for the future? So only those two questions are looking to it. Other than that, grades, degree, it really doesn't matter. Because nowadays every everything's about the self-learning. So yeah. Okay, so I want to switch uh, to a different kind of topic. Um, what motivates you? Wow, what motivates me? That's a really good one though, you know, because it's it's cause you know, earlier, you know, when when we were back in days, we, we were really key, it motivates different different small things but now if i see a broad spectrum okay uh legacy legacy really motivates me because i really want to be legacy you know, for an example you know i really one of my favorite favorite speaker um, gary from Vinan media he really building legacy so that's what i want to do even in the future even, even if i die but then i want to make sure the the legacy is behind me and the mri case reports is literally going ahead and i would love to be a unicorn in the market research industry so I want to keep that legacy rest of my life, even, even after when I die, <laughs> I hope not, not too soon. But then I want to build that legacy. That really motivates me. I can't hear you. Can you hear me OK? OK, finally, okay. I'm going to thought, oh my god, I'm okay, going to no. the glitch. Everything's OK don't scare me now <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so we have a question uh, from facebook so mary so uh, we talked about uh, the skills right you named several of them so her question is uh, one of the fundamental skills wouldn't that be curiosity i mean you, you mentioned you know uh, ability to deal with challenges how about curiosity that's one of the traits we can look into it if the person is curious or intrigued about the fee about the future why not we can definitely take those candidates because if the person is curious they can find out multiple ways to get the answer so yeah the fundamentals to solve the curiosity is definitely one of the good traits you know uh, yeah it's, it's that's we, we definitely consider that for sure okay wonderful i have a different question here uh, our good friend kai hello kai uh, he's asking, can market research be distributed? Uh, so in what context, I would like to know. Because uh, if it's distributed, is it like it, 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 is it in terms of the market research reports or how it's going to be? It's, it's, yes. it's really subjective question. Let's wait for Kai to um, add some yeah. more thoughts to his question. But you do, so how do you, by the way, how do you distribute your reports today? okay well we have okay we are fortunate enough we have a lot of clients for the fortune 500 companies across the globe that's the first thing we get a lot of references and we do a lot of branding and marketing we do uh promotion on like highly paid websites and also we uh reach out to the non-regional web websites across the globe so then we make sure we tap each and every market and each and every client because we don't want to miss the Japanese or let's say even Asian or American or English, whatever. So there are a lot, almost 200 countries out there. So we make sure our reports are being delivered in each and every language and also we're doing promotion each and every different, different languages. So then we now we capture the market. So well, that's, that's how good, we distribute it. Yeah. So good questions. You said different languages. How, how many languages are the reports written or what are they available? On. uh it can be available in 27 languages as, as of now wow 27 yeah because our research team they are really highly expert they are really really expertise in, in their own field and we have of course content writer because you know you can't use really google just like english to french that because that a lot of grammar mistakes and the, 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 the statements really haywire so we don't do that so we really high people we really have people from the French region, from the Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Mexican, then we now... And then you can go to Malaga. That's why you, you hire them. That's right? what I'm saying, exactly. So then I know once I go to Malaga, then I have my people, if I don't know whatever I want to do, I can come and say, hey... Do you, do you have an office in Malaga? Do you have to go there? 
Uh, well, not yet, but then definitely that's one of my, you know, it's really popped up into my head right now. I, I don't mind to open an office in uh, Malaga. Do you know what okay. I'm saying? Well, uh, actually, on, on, on that note, uh, let's talk about uh, your future plans, not the future of the industry, not the future of anything else. How about you? What? So what are your future plans? Uh, um, more reports? Are you planning a summit? A get together, you know, I think now people can indeed have summits, right? Can can they not? So what are you planning? Yeah, Ali, like, um, recently in Expo 2020, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I couldn't see myself. I was like, okay, my God, again, again, I'm gone. Okay, so I was saying, so recently uh, we have just uh, went to Expo 2020 and we represent MRIC's reports in Dubai. And we fortunate enough, we have interacted with more than 190 countries over there, 190 people from across the globe. And in the in the coming 22nd of Jan 2022, we're gonna have another summit in Hammersmith in London. And we're gonna invite our clients from Fortune 500. And also they, they're going to be, uh, we are, they're going to give like 50 complimentary tickets to our first come first basis so so we can do that and uh, so yeah so we are looking forward to have Hammersmith uh, like summit in, in, in the Hammersmith in London oh, wonderful so when exactly is it do you do you have a date 20, 22nd of Jan January 22nd 26th 22nd yeah. oh I have to hear more about that when you have have the program and you know please uh, let me know love to hear yes. more about what you guys are, are planning and uh, you know what you want to talk about because that's yes that's part of the fun is understanding what's going to go on what you want to talk about what you're going to be sharing and that kind of stuff uh so i want to switch uh the conversation a little bit you know uh, on a different kind of note uh, so what keeps you up at night any kind of worries wow any kind of good worries well but it's, it's again it's, it's really de depend on my mood you know <laughs> but then you know i i always think to myself you know how can i contribute to the society but recently you know there's one institute there's ngo uh, uh, that's called egi in canada Saskatchewan. so we have donated thousand dollars over there to help uh african childs for their health food education so i always think to myself we gotta give back something to societies so helping donating so i really want to contribute to society like you know look at the elon musk he's he's always talking about we gotta give back to the society so that really gave me impression like okay i maybe i might follow his path and the second thing maybe you know my vision or mission about my company that really keeps me at night because the vision is in a mirror like we really want to make a huge difference to our clients and our their clients uh, and this third thing, uh, motivational speakers, because there are a lot of, I, I don't know, somehow you know, that I have that fantasy in my mind. I really want to help people. Like, it's it just my, one of that thought in my mind, because there are two, two name few, okay? Les Brown is one of my favorite motivational speakers, then Grant Cardon, Jordan Belfort, Brian Tracy, Eric Thompson, Zig Ziglar. So every day I keep listening to them and I keep, even in the night, so then I really channelize my brain Then I know what I want, where, where I wanna go. Cause, I, cause if, you are, if you are with the set people, with the set sort of people, with this, then you only get this much ideas. But then when I keep listening to this motivation speaker, then I get to know, okay, wow, this, is, this can be happened. So I, I'm always intrigued about the future and I keep listening to motivational speeches and then I know I can keep my brain active and I keep my core front text active so then I know um, I'm on the right path. So, so, that, so, so, that, so that's the answer to your question. Well, so um, along the same lines, uh, so not what keeps you up at night, but uh, um, what gives you hope? What inspires you about the future? Wow, okay. So... Because I think the new market, because you know, because right now the, the world is changing rapidly, so we would love to chair a tap untapped market, uh, which hasn't been untapped. Uh, so we are again, this, we are always discovering if the market has, hasn't been untapped, and we we would love to invest our money. Uh, we, we don't mind to become an angel investor or VCs to tap this market, and then also the big data. Uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, 
So that really excites me about the future because that's the future of, 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 of our planet. So I'm really excited about the future. That's good. I think uh, uh, we have lots of futurists uh, um, on the show, and I think we should all be you know, hopeful or, or have a good vision of the future. Or else, you know, the future will materialize as not being so good. If we think it's not going to be good, it will not turn out good. So, uh, talking of futurists, uh, Kai is the prominent futurist in Germany, and he is asking you: Do you have any thoughts uh, on the? So, you talk about technology, AI, and how it will change the world. So the wisdom of the swarm. Wisdom of the swarm. So is that talking about the bird or what exactly? Uh, no, so the, the swarm. So now I think it's the, the, the new uh, consciousness of uh, the internet, the, the collective, right? So how, the, the, how this is changing the way we interact. So now we have not just the collective, but now we have the metaverse. We have uh, a variety of, of different things. So he's adding uh, in a question about distributing, uh, so distributed computing, again, along the same lines of, you know, now we have metaverse, we have a, a bunch of things, the idea of distributed computing, uh, all this connectivity, uh, the data being shared, uh, different ways. Uh, in the old days, we talked on the phone, we typed, we read reports, we read the newspaper. Nowadays, I guess, if you write and you hit save, I can see or you can share why you are creating so all this information being distributed, you know, live simultaneously, yeah. right? So how will that um, affect the way you work? Uh, well, it's definitely uh, AI will, again, will play the main role because uh, it has been distributed sometimes manually, you know, data has been collected. So we now we are going the right track, but then now since we are going to adapt a new more technology, which, which I said, the Google just got the uh, sense of the technology uh, just imagine like we never thought of the Google would come up with some sort of technology then they do even that technology will tell if the mobile is handled by human if, if it's shaky if it's wobbly or if it's just a robot it just got in a few seconds so hence we are again more focusing on the AI and ML than in, in terms of computing distribution of, of, of the market so yeah uh, so the technology we are really focusing on the AI at this point of time Okay, I have a different kind of question from Daniel. Uh, so Daniel asks, uh, what kind of programs or software do you use or you recommend to organize data for market research? Well, the big data apparently, that's the, it, it gives an access to collect or monitor uh, and get any sort of analyze the data within no time. But again, you know, in our in house, we have built our own software so we can uh, organize our data in such a way. Because, at, okay, it's, it's a really good question though. Because right now we got seven hundred thousand reports ready made right now on our websites, and we have published more than one million reports from last six to seven years. And we have been fortunate enough that our we have all reported declines from Fortune five hundred. So, uh, so the big data, and then if you create your own software in order to get the access in an easy way, then that's that's the best then. All righty, wonderful. So it looks like uh, uh, we went through um, all the questions, you know, Mahesh, you know, thank you so much for being here with me and the guests today, you know, I most certainly enjoyed the interview. I really want to hear more about the uh, the summit, what you have in mind. We were bringing yes. what you're going to be talking about. So you know, we need to talk more about that. So if definitely, you guys definitely. Uh, have more questions for Mahesh, please uh, make sure you check in our YouTube channel. Leave comments over there. I know where he is. He's going to Malaga. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have any more questions or comments, uh, make sure you, you drop them in there and, and I will check check on them and, and I will make sure that, you know, Mahesh gets the questions in the comments. And of course, yes, please uh, uh, do like the video, subscribe to our channel. Uh, that's the best way uh, to keep in touch. So uh, again, Mahesh, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, transition now to uh, Fouad and I will welcome him to the show. Nice to have you here, Mahesh. Thank you. Same here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, move. Um, I have to pull some more information. 
So this is a little bit about uh, Fuad. Uh, he's the director of strategy for Everbridge. He's an expert in business and product strategy. But today, as I promised, we're going to be talking about his book because I already asked him too, too many questions about the other stuff he does. So uh, his new book is The Competitive Intelligence Playbook, How to Build, Manage, and Optimize a Competitive Intelligence Program. It is available on Amazon.com. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let's... Uh, uh, welcome, Fuad, to the show. Hi, Fuad. Good to see you. Hello, Rom. Always a pleasure. How are you uh, doing? Welcome. Good and uh, nice to have you here. Bienvenue. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Merci. Merci. Salam. <laughs> so uh, I was going to give you a hard time on football, uh, given what Mahesh told me. And I said, I, I think I can guess. But since you are in Montreal, uh, it's perhaps best that I ask you about what's your favorite Ice hockey team. Yeah. Do you have one? <laughs> of course, Canadian. Uh, Canadian de Montréal. But uh, I'm not a, a hockey fan, so, uh, yeah. You mean you still have all your teeth? Smile, please. Uh, yeah, exactly. See. If you talk, oh, okay. if you ask me about Formula One, I will be able to uh, to respond. That's, that's for sure. But other sports, I think it's uh, maybe less. I'm not uh, a big fan of uh, other sports. I understand. Okay, now the really hard question. Ooh. And that can offend people if you get it wrong. So what's your favorite band? Uh, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd, well, you, you didn't even blink. Yeah, no, no, no. It's very clear in my mind since I was young. Uh, and the first song I, 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 I listened was uh, Welcome to the Machine. Welcome. So uh, not The Wall or The Other Side of the Moon? No, it was Black Welcome Dog. to the Machine, then uh, Shine, Our, Shine Our, Your Crazy Diamond. And wish you were here and things like that. But uh, and I'm talking uh, the the old discs, not the the uh, let's say uh, uh, MP3 or something like that. Really old, like LPs. The, 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 yeah, the real physical vinyl. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's, fantastic. It's I did not know about that about you. So that's why I'm asking those kinds of questions because it's we get to know each other. You know, <laughs> my pleasure. It's a conversation, so bring yeah. it on. Now I want to know what's your favorite spot in the whole world oh that i did already visited or not yes or it, one what is your favorite one and then uh, the place that you would like to go uh where i want to go i think uh, some uh, island uh, somewhere sun uh, uh, white sand something like that that would uh, do some good with the pandemic and everything, we didn't have the opportunity to travel anywhere. So mm. uh, I don't know uh, anywhere Seychelles, Maldives, th things like that. It's fancy, but I don't. I'm not looking for fancy. I'm looking for white sand and uh, sun and getting some color. Uh, uh, yeah, for the places I, I've been, uh, I think one of the best was uh, a city I lived in. Uh, it was Strasbourg in France. Strasbourg. Oh. Yeah, and this period of the year, I think it's a, one of the best places uh, in the world to be you have uh, uh, how to say christmas market one of the biggest uh, oh, yeah. in the world few million people go in there every year and uh, yeah it's very very uh, very nice there so uh, if you go to europe i mm. i would advise you to go take a look the christmas market now, yeah. i'm sorry you did go to school in strasbourg did you not exactly i did my okay. university uh, part of uh, my university studies in uh, strasbourg it was in uh, international relations uh, uh, relations and it was competitive intelligence and uh, international business development so i spent uh, some uh, a year on half there now i actually never asked you the question but how did you go from applied mathematics to competitive intelligence well it yeah. doesn't seem that they they jive but apparently they do <laughs> yeah they do they do well it was a transition first i started with the operational research or applied mathematics as you said and uh it was too uh, cartesian <laughs> let's say i found myself that way so i started working for a, a an a, a oil and gas company at the beginning energy industry and i was a market analyst and uh, and uh, I was doing competitive intelligence, by the way, but I, but I didn't know that it was a thing. And I discovered by doing market uh, analysis that I was looking at competitors. So I tried to uh, get some information about that field. And I discovered that it was a field in itself. So I decided just to, uh, uh, to, 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 to do it. And I left my, my job and I went to France to, uh, to, 
to pursue first study then practice and i practiced practiced it in in, in few uh, companies uh, since then so yeah this is how how i find myself See, I did not Italy. know that about you either, because yeah, you, know, yeah. you, you actually well today. <laughs> gave up on a bunch of things and you pursue your dreams and your passion and oh yeah, left off you go. Left the country, left uh, left uh, a company, but uh, look, uh, if, if there is something you really uh, want to do and like to do, and this is what I say all the time about competitive intelligence, it's not even a, a job. Because uh, I saw a question before, curiosity, is it a skill? I think it's the most important skill in competitive intelligence because we have that intellectual curiosity. We want to learn, we want to know, and we want to bring it to the company. But first, even if we are not working, we're curious people. We want to learn more and anticipate, even if it's not uh, uh, possible to predict the future. Certainly. But we collect as many data points to understand what can happen. And that's that's what drove me to to change and change again so actually paul says hey okay so you know go pursue your passions change your <laughs> life live where you are go somewhere some other place it's thanks paul it's it's uh always fun uh to uh hear all those things and and, and realize so um uh let's uh, continue along the same lines i know it's uh there are different kinds of questions today but mm -hmm. you now we're talking about your book and I, you're an accomplished professional. I don't want to talk about the professional side. I want to get to know you better as sure. a, a writer. So uh, inspiration, what inspires you to write? Why do you write? Mm -hmm. Well, look, first, I, did, I never thought that I would write really? and be an author and publish a book. But uh, I don't know for you, but sometimes you have some ideas in your mind and... Uh, it's, it's like a, an internal chatter about the way of uh, doing things. We can do, uh, let's say, competitive intelligence or uh, other activities in, 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 in a more efficient way. And I was thinking about that and uh, I was uh, moving, let's say, from a company uh, to another. And I found myself in kind of similar situations where I, I, I needed to build from scratch what I already did in different places. And I always had to explain to people what we need to do, how to do it, to uh, convince uh, stakeholders. And even people I, I was working with, uh, team members, uh, CI team members, uh, or, or, or people I was collaborating with, uh, I needed to explain and convince, et cetera. So I was more and more thinking uh, how to codify this uh, in, 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 in such a way that people can understand it very quickly. Not, ther not very ther theoretical. Uh, yeah, you don't need a PhD to understand uh, what's in the book. So yeah, basically, uh, this is why I started uh, writing. And by the way, I was taking notes since I started working. So uh, sometimes I say it's uh, the book that took uh, the, the, the longest period of time to be uh, published because it's, al fine. it's always part of, uh, of uh, my job. Let's say when I learn something, I take notes. And before I had, let's say, uh, a, 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 how to say a, a simple notebook paper and a pen and the uh, people thought thought that i was an investigator anywhere i was going so because i was taking notes and they were making jokes with that after that well uh, came the phone so i was always taking notes with my phone and uh, the thoughts how to optimize the way we are doing things in competitive intelligence i was taking those notes also and i tried to gather all those notes that i took over time to to maybe build something that can be useful to people. So, uh, but this is this is about uh, let's say uh, CI about writing. I think this is uh, one of the best ways to 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 convey a message and to to keep it alive. Uh, let's say whatever we do, and I learned that uh, early on. Uh, we, we learn, we practice, and we share. And there are different ways yeah. to share. We share through this event. And thanks a lot, Ron, for what uh, oh, everything that you are doing. Here. The magazine, this uh, this platform, and everything you're doing for CI and for other fields, and this is the way we can share uh, uh, written or conversation. But we have to bring it out there. We have to help other people if we know how to do something, if we learn. And it might not be perfect, and we are still learning. We'll always be learning, but at least what we know that can work, uh, let's share it with people. Uh, in in any way possible. So a book is one way to do it. Well, absolutely. This is a learning instrument for 
all of us, you know, that's really, really why I started this is because, you know, talking, you know, people like you and I learn stuff and talking like to Paul or to Kai or, you know, to Mary, uh, uh, everybody's got, you know, they, they'll be sharing. And the more we share, uh, the more we grow, we grow together. We can exchange thoughts and ideas. And that's really why the magazine exists and is. And it's, uh, it's the idea of exchanging sharing thoughts and ideas. Sharing is indeed caring. Uh, so uh, we talked about writing in general, but is there um, uh, a specific point in time that uh, you can say that, hey, uh, about the CI playbook, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write the CI playbook. Is there mm -hmm. a specific point that yeah. you decided that's it, that, that's what I'm going to go do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would I would wear a, a shirt where, where I write uh, 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 I love CI, something like that. It's just a joke, but uh, I, I perfectly remember where when I started uh, really writing this book. I was taking my coffee one morning, and I had my phone in front of me, and I just uh, was writing my notes as usual, and I saw that the document was, let's say, uh, reaching the limit of uh, Google uh, Keep. So <laughs> I needed to create a document for that, and I was saying, wait a minute. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something I want to do. It's something I want to build. Let's give it a try. So I started uh, learning about how to write a book, for example, uh, how, how to make sense of the content in the book, etc. It took some time, but uh, I found myself without making, making a lot of efforts, just putting notes, just organizing those ideas and saying what goes first, what goes second, uh, etc. So yeah, this is uh, how, it, how it started. And it was a, a winter morning. I think it was uh, not winter. It's uh, nearly spring, but in Montreal, spring and winter. I mean, in March, it's still snowing. So, yeah. Oh, here I have summer for nine months of the year. So I, oh, yeah. what can I, I say about Montreal? I would say look at you, but uh, I love winter. So it's not a problem. Oh, anything. I love winter too. Well, I don't like shoveling snow. That's a different different question. I, I probably should have a poem here. Who likes shoveling up snow? Nobody does. It keeps you healthy. So, some exercise. Oh, you like the snow, really? Oh, brother, you, you're good. You're really, I mean, it's not New York snow. It's not gray. It's just white, white, and you love it. And you can. And we're it. talking now. It's November, but in April, we all hated shoveling. Oh, certainly. Oh, that stays with us here too. After a while, the heat you just. Mm -hmm. you know. So I want to go back to your uh, you as an as a writer, as an mm -hmm. author. I have a question for Mary in Facebook. Uh, so I wonder if inspiration is a kind of influence or is it a motivation so influence versus motivation what is it for you yeah i i, I would say it's both because first we get influenced uh, and we uh, whatever we do and whatever uh, where, wherever we are in life uh, we get influenced by by uh, many things we can be influenced by news by people around us or by things we read or or or, or something like that so Maybe it can be a trigger that influence, but after that, it's motivation to keep going uh, over time to do something about it because you can be influenced and you learn, you say, oh, that's really interesting. I love it and go to another call or move to another call. But if you want to stay there and to keep doing, let's say, whether, as I said, uh, writing a book, uh, a blog, uh, uh, a video, I don't know, anything. You need that that motivation to continue doing whatever we, you are doing, whether it's competitive intelligence or something else. Uh, and and I really believe in that. If if uh, influence alone, if you are influenced, it won't help, because uh, the moment you have another influence, you will forget the first influence. Motivation will keep you uh, going uh, uh, going there. And this is why going back to curiosity, when you want to learn, uh, people will will have to stop you from doing that. Not motivate you to do that you are so motivated in that and sometimes i have that that comment because people don't like looking for that information analyzing etc but we love it so uh we do it and uh, people say how how can you get motivated with that well it's simply who we are well i think you you hit a very interesting uh chord in there because uh, people like it magnifique so it's oh. uh, influence it is yeah it's it's all of the above and the curiosity i guess so uh, uh talking about uh, curiosity let's uh, uh go back to the book proper mm -hmm. uh, so so what readers can expect from your book 
as I read your book, what should I expect? Yeah, I, I would say what I was expecting in the past when I was starting, and this is what I wanted to build. I was I wanted to find real life examples and real life, uh, how to say, processes working or not working, what worked, what didn't work. But uh, I didn't want to start with the, the SWOT, uh, straight weaknesses, uh, opportunity, and uh, threats that we know, pastel or something like that, the, the four forces uh, and things like that, that we know from, uh, from, from business school. But it's not uh, uh, enough to build a, a, a CI uh, a program. There's the human side of things. There's budgets. There's uh, the team. There are tools, the platforms, whether they do the job. Uh, or, or not. So there are a lot of things that we didn't, uh, or I didn't, uh, let's say, uh, come across. So I wanted to build something, like say, I was imagining myself in the past trying to build a program starting in CI. And what would have helped me to start in the right foot, not make some mistakes that I made in the past and I learned from that. So this is what I wanted to, to do. And this is what I or people can expect from the book to find some steps, guidelines from reality, from learned experience to, 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 to set up their program and to, uh, let's say, uh, make it work. And it's one perspective, of course. They can have their own perspective and they can uh, maybe have better programs than uh, what, what, what I've built so far. But um, it, it's here to help people to see a better uh, uh, into how to build, manage, and optimize uh, programs because there's a lot of uh, fragmented knowledge out there. And you have a lot of content about how to set up a CI program. But I wanted to add to, uh, to that uh, the, the human side of things or, or uh, real examples from experience. Uh, yeah, this is, this is what I tried to, uh, to do and this is what people can expect from that. Now I have a very tough question. Go ahead, shoot. Okay, so this one is about what is your favorite child kind of question. So it, I'll, I'll do my best. So Marjolaine Desjeron, she asks, which part of the book you enjoyed the most writing and why? So what's your favorite child? Uh, I think the last two chapters, to be honest. Uh, the last two chapters, because uh, I was thinking about writing a book just about do, those two chapters. And uh, uh, yeah, I didn't have enough time. I needed to publish the book. So, uh, and it's uh, all about uh, influence and uh, the human side of things. Uh, I think this is this is the part where, uh, beyond all the methods, the techniques, the tools, etc., we face the reality of any organization. Even in the same family, you will have this kind of considerations: different personalities, different goals, uh, different strategies, uh, different kind of st stakeholders, and uh, all of uh, these people are 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 contributing, or they will they will they will uh, how to say make or break your program if 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 not uh, uh, dealt with uh, the right way. So uh, for me, yeah, that was that was uh, the, the 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 part where I I I had the most fun, and I invite people to see. Uh, the painting of, uh, I think it was uh, Eugène de la Croix, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Grey Eminence. Mm -hmm. And if it's not Eugène de la Croix, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I forgot the name of the, uh, the, the painter, but it was depicting uh, uh, François Dutremblay and uh, Cardinal de Richelieu, and people were bowing to uh, François Dutremblay, who was uh, an advisor for Cardinal de Richelieu. He was not the decision maker, he was the influencer. He was mm -hmm. influencing the decision, and people recognized who was the, the real uh, decision maker, the one who was the gray eminence or eminence gris, uh, mm -hmm. helping the decision maker to make, to, to, to make decisions. And this, this uh, taught me a, a lot or resonated a lot uh, with me because uh, sometimes we just uh, target the hierarchy and we think that because there's an SVP or something like that, here's where, where, where you have to, to go and to have the conversation. But uh, organizations are networks. And we, we get to identify those networks and who's, who, who's uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, more friendly with who, who's collaborating with who. So otherwise, whatever we can 
build when we get to present it sometimes for no reason some people will resist it and we don't understand why so that side i think it's really really important in competitive intelligence and any field by the way it's not just competitive intelligence it's just so something that we're talking about competitive intelligence i'm gonna pick on a bunch of people they're still on the line so kai mm -hmm. and paul if you're still watching so and i'm gonna ask you for what so are we all eminence grace or should we aspire to become ones be that uh, silent person influencing the decision maker is that the role of ci yes <laughs> short question short answer for ci and uh, market intelligence i really think that our role and and uh, yesterday i was uh, uh, discussing this and i was saying as a community maybe somehow we dropped the ball when it comes to making ci a strategic uh, uh, function and strategic role within organization our organizations because in 20 years, nearly 20 years, it's still CI analysts and people identify CI folks as analysts, not strategists, not leaders. And this is something that needs to change over time, obviously, because the influence we can have on the decision making, not because we want to manipulate or anything, because we have more knowledge, we have more tools to analyze and more methods. And we have ways to build those uh, insights and recommendations that can help uh, better decision making or uh, help the organization to avoid some mistakes. We have it, but it's not leveraged. Why? Because we're stuck in that role of analysis. And it's, it's, it's really uh, negative sometimes. Why? Because you don't get the budget, you don't get the team, you don't get the, uh, the how to say, attention of, uh, let's say the decision makers uh, everywhere. So that depends a lot on us and how we position ourselves within any organization, whether we want to uh, position ourselves as analysts, so we will just find information, analyze and ship reports or sit in the decision table or participate uh, via sponsors and make sure that uh, the, the voice of competitive intelligence is heard and it's, it's included in the decision-making process. It impacts the decision-making. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, the, 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 uh, the best way to position uh, competitive intelligence. So to your question, yes, definitely, we have to be uh, th th those uh, eminence, uh, gray eminences for our organizations and to build our influence inside the organization. Okay. So I wanted to go back to uh, you as a writer. So that's uh, a part of the, the questions that we're getting here. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I try to tell people, it's not hard to start a book. It's difficult to finish a book because you have so much to say, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Kai is posing an interesting question here, right? So if we, because again, back to the influence and the curiosity and, and the play between the influence and the curiosity, mm -hmm. if you let the curiosity run amok, right? Mm -hmm. So so we need we need some discipline so you know the cat knows the cat you know the curious cat died i yeah. guess yeah. so uh how how do you balance the the influence with yeah. the motivation and the curiosity how do you find a mm -hmm. healthy balance so mm -hmm. things can still move on uh, by the way thanks kai it's it's really well written the cats know <laughs> and sometimes it's tricky because we we can we can go to some areas we don't want to go uh from for for many reasons uh, ethical, legal, and uh, few things. Let's say in French they say "béni soit les ignorants." Let's say the ignorants are 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 blessed. And uh, sometimes some some kind of information or intelligence is not in the realm of competitive intelligence or open source intelligence. So uh, we have to uh, uh, stay stay in 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 our area. Let's say uh, from an ethical standpoint. So uh, we limit somehow, even if we are curious, the, the, the reach not to get to some information we, we wouldn't have access to uh, in, uh, as open source. Uh, we just don't do it because there, there's so much trouble with that, uh, uh, even legal trouble. So uh, we can do that. And the second thing is about time management. Uh, and it's true. Sometimes we are so curious, we are going, uh, after every piece of intelligence we can get out there and we can spend hours or days or even weeks just looking for information but we have a deadline to deliver on uh, let's say a presentation or a report and we don't have enough time at the end of the day for analysis for summarizing for 
build in those uh, recommendations or build a story around that uh, all the intelligence we gather to provide a recommendation. So I think time management here in competitive intelligence is really important to make sure that you're not spending more than 20 to 30 percent of your time gathering that intelligence to spend enough time to analyze that intelligence and after that communicating that intelligence which is really overlooked most of the time we think it's just a report but it's way more than that it's a message it's a story to share with stakeholders so yeah the two sides curiosity is uh, not uh, blessed sometimes uh, when it goes beyond our scope of uh, uh, open source intelligence and the second is when we are curious and we are just spending our time gathering intelligence we might not have all the time we need to do the other parts of the intelligence cycle so it's a lot of caution with that so thanks kai for this i was i was afraid you're gonna say meow or something like that so <laughs> it's, it's okay so uh along the same lines so uh nowadays we kind of have to juggle several oranges at the same time so you have mm -hmm. human you have sock mint you know mm -hmm. you know uh, human intelligence, uh, social media intelligence. We have OSINT, open source intelligence. So uh, Akai has a, an interesting follow-up question that he's sharing. So uh, in times of increasing digitization, right, is the human side, the human, right, mm -hmm. getting even more interesting for CI? So now, how is the effect of digitalization on the way you gather intelligence more or less human, more or less suck mint, more or less OSINT? Mm -hmm. how, how, how is your balance on the intelligence collection? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say there is a ratio between them, but okay. I, I would say human, uh, the human side of things, it's really important and it will remain important all the time uh, uh, in competitive intelligence for the simple reason that sometimes people don't tweet it. They don't write about it. They don't post anything on social media about it. It's just in the heads of the sales rep, the customer support, the customer uh, himself or herself. And that intelligence, we can we, we, we need to get it anyway. So it's our role to get to those people, to sit with those people and to have the conversation, primary intelligence, uh, because it won't we, we won't find it any any way uh, differently. So it won't uh, end up in social media or something like that. So it's more content that we can get from social media and uh, other spaces, even meta metaverse in the future, maybe we'll be able to get some intelligence there because people will start to post information or share things uh, there. It's a long Over shot. there and not, and not here, you feel, you feel that we'll get to the point where the world really transitions from the real world into the metaverse and they talk over there and not here or? Uh, I, I, I think it's, it will be a mix of everything, but uh, the idea here is to get intelligence where it is. And some people will be more comfortable sharing in this format. Some people will just, be comfortable sharing uh, around a, a coffee or a beer. Uh, some people will share it on social media and uh, cr create content about it and talk to their colleagues. And the others will just try to leverage uh, anything new to, to do it. If there is a new social media and or metaverse or etc., some of them will go there. So uh, we have to follow uh, the intelligence where we can find it. Uh, that that's that's my point it's not one or an, another i think it's a mix of everything mm -hmm. but uh, the human side or uh, is really re important and it will remain important in intelligent gathering just when we take win loss analysis for example we get so much information about uh, where why the customer uh, decided to buy our product or not and this information well we, we will not find it in a, a g2 crowd or something like that sometimes if they are not happy, they will post a review and we can find it there. But most of the time, no, they will just be silent switchers. But we have the duty to get that intelligence wherever it is. So, yeah, I, I hope I it guess, helps. Oh, it does. I think you have a new kind of quote. Uh, we have to follow the intelligence where to find it. That is a good one. Maybe that's a, a chapter for your next book. Yeah, maybe. So you can encourage <laughs> people to go oh, talking about uh, about the book. Let's, it's uh Ask a question about the book. So what is MVP? The Minimum Viable Competitive Intelligence Program. Yeah. What is that and what do you mean by that? Uh, it's uh, The inspiration was from uh, product management. I had a uh, few years in product management as product manager and product director. And uh, MVP is a minimum viable product, but I was thinking for CI, it's kind of the same. What is the minimum viable program we can build 
to deliver value to the organization without uh, breaking the bank or, uh, <laughs> or, or spending uh, too much money because obviously we don't have a lot of budget, at least at the beginning. So what's the least uh, we can start with to make the program work? And it goes to first, uh, let's say the value we provide because the less we have resources, the most we need to prioritize and organize to make sure that we are providing value for the most important topics and areas uh, the, the organization is working on. That's first. Second uh, is the budget. And sometimes we hear about platforms and things like that. And platforms are good. They're doing a good job. But uh, some competitive intelligence programs were, were, were built without any pro uh, tool or platform. It's more the uh, skills of the, 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 uh, the CI professionals, uh, which helped to create the program. Uh, you have the timeline also because, okay, let's say you start the program and people rely on you to deliver, but you have a deadline for that. We can't spend just a, a whole year just trying to build a report or something like that. It wouldn't work. So there's, let's say, what uh, what I call the rule, uh, 100 days rule for time to value. And I got inspired from the political world. They say the first 100 days uh, they have to deliver for CI. I think it's the same. To get it up and running and start delivering value at the strategic level and tactical level in the first uh, 100 days. So you start by learning about the organizations, uh, organization you're working with. Uh, you don't take forever to do that, two weeks, three weeks to do that, to talk with people, to know the processes, et cetera. Uh, you, 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 you start to, uh, how to say, build the templates for reports, presentations, et cetera. You test do those, uh, those, uh, those uh, 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 CI outputs with your stakeholders. And then you launch it uh, officially and you iterate. You iterate and you learn each time and you improve. You will make some mistakes. You will correct it over time. And, and, and at least you're delivering value. People are seeing uh, competitive intelligence, your insights, your recommendations, etc. But my advice is uh, don't take more than three months. Give yourself 10 days buffer. I don't know, Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving and things like that. But uh, don't take too much time to deliver value. Otherwise, people will start to question. Uh, what you are doing because they're obviously paying money for for, for the program Certainly. one way or another so i want to ask you a view of uh, of competitive intelligence so some people say well this is just corporate profiles and battle cards right is it what else is out there yeah well uh thanks for uh, this question and uh, it, it's a uh, it's dear to my heart when we're talking about the ci outputs and uh most of the time we hear about battle cards because it is the easiest, uh, let's say, output. But uh, I personally don't like focusing on battle cards because it's really tactical. And it's made to, let's say, uh, help make deals. And uh, let's say how to attack, how to defend, and uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses, etc. That's That's really important. But uh, the goal is way more than that. It's It's more to really understand at the deep level, uh, the competitive landscape, the competitors, their profile completely and uh, the, their products, how they compare to us. And more than that, when we have that picture of, of, uh, of our competitive landscape and we know uh, what, they are, uh, what they are offering and where they are up to is to not predict the future because I don't believe we can predict the future, but increase the, num the, the, the data points, uh, allowing us to uh, see what what is the most probable uh, uh, action that they will perform in the future so there's way more than that so when you're talking about battle cards it's just tactical at strategic level i, I really think big picture uh, about the competition let's say top three competitors then top 10 and uh, the trends uh, and the features uh, customers are looking for or services customers are looking for etc and how these competitors are responding or they're working on, if there are patents on that or uh, anything that will show us that the market is going there, whether it's a blue ocean or a red ocean and things like that. So way more than a uh, battle card, I would say, uh, way more uh, uh, CI outputs, which are uh, more strategic than that. And this is something we really keep in mind as CI professionals. Uh, when we hear about battle cards, we always say, yes, we will help you with that. But it's not uh, it's not everything we do in competitive intelligence. It's Certainly. way more than that. 
So I wanted to go back to the MVP. So Daniel has a question for you. So uh, do you select a specific se segment for MVP or do you consider this to be a better approach than say a focus group? Well, uh, do you select a specific segment for MVP? Uh, okay, uh, if, if I understand well, do we prioritize? And yes, definitely, we prioritize even the topics we're working on. Or if, if we have, let's say several products, we will, we will, we will select our, our markets or uh, key intelligence topics, we will select those key intelligence topics that can provide most the most value for the organization. So we know that some areas will not be covered at the beginning. We know that. But we, 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 we are comfortable with that and we share it with stakeholders. Really important to communicate with stakeholders at the beginning to, 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 to tell them that we will help. But here's the situation. Here's where we are going to start. And it's a conversation. So if people say, no, no, this topic or this product or this market is really important, it's strategic right now, we need to work on that. Good. It will help us to prioritize. Doesn't mean that we will just do because people are asking for it, but we will uh, assess it, we will prioritize, and we will come up with the, uh, a list of priorities. We, we will never have the time to do everything, but we will for sure have the time to do the most important things. And this is this is uh, really uh, something I, I I live by because uh, uh, if if it answers the question because when we're talking about specific segment I hear a specific product specific areas uh, topics markets and for that definitely and the rule of three uh, I believe in that too so what are the three most important product let's start what is the most important product let's say then the three most important product then the ten most important product if we have that. Same for the market, same for, for everything. And uh, we build upon that. So going from the, the me to we, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the definition of a good CI team? What would say, well, this is a, a good we. Yeah, I see them like in the movie, Troy with the Brad Pitt. It's uh, Myrmidon. Let's say uh, they, they were in their boat and everyone uh, was trying to get to the, uh, the shore but uh, they, they were going faster and they, are, they were fearless. I would say the team uh, for CI, it's, it's a highly motivated team, highly curious people, uh, uh, analytical, but uh, good communicators also. That's really important. Uh, a lot of situations where we're talking about domain expertise, sometimes it's necessary, but most often it can be learned. Why? Because we are curious and we have a learning mindset. So it wouldn't be an issue after, few months, few uh, years, maybe, if it's needed, uh, people will be uh, the experts in their fields. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I saw that uh, firsthand. But uh, the curiosity of people, the, 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 the growth mindset or learning mindset, uh, the analytical skills and the communication plus influence, that's really important. So uh, the more we go uh, in time, let's say we start with gathering intelligence, but at some point it will not be enough from team members. Second, we analyze or they analyze, but it won't be enough at some point. They will need to communicate that, to build their report, to make their presentations, to think what, so what, now what. And when it comes to now what, what is their recommendation for action? A uh, uh, competitive response, continue to monitor or build a new feature or something like that. And it's an advice or suggestion for the, 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 the product team or marketing team or sales. But uh, yeah, I think they, the team needs to be completely comfortable with the cycle. Uh, the curiosity will allow them to learn fast about the product, the company, the uh, industry, stakeholders also. A lot of, uh, uh, how to say, communication, I mean, uh, uh, discussion with people also. So uh, not to antagonize anyone, but to be uh, clear about what we do and what we don't do, uh, this kind of things. And uh, if, if I refer to the uh, book uh, Drive from uh, Daniel Pink, it says there are three things uh, very important for uh, knowledge workers, which I consider we are. Uh, you have uh, uh, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. So first thing for people uh, in the team and for me also is to have a clear purpose, a uh, clear goal, why we are here. We're not here just to ship intelligence uh, day in, day out. So that has to be clear and we always define it with the team. Uh, our goal, big, hairy, audacious goal, and uh, and uh, autonomy. We give each other uh, the autonomy to work 
on their topics, following the cycle, etc. And we give each other feedback all the time. And mastery. Uh, over time, what's needed is to be uh, the masters of our craft, uh, our field, our product, our market. So to become the people uh, the, to, to go whenever there is a question about the market competition or even customers, what they're saying about our product or co copy their product. So when you build that, uh, how to say, that, uh, that uh, strength for or muscle for the organization, I think that's where you can say that you have uh, uh, a strong or a good team for CI. Wonderful. So along the same lines, you, I, I think you described several things. So I'm curious more about, you know, the, a day in the life of, right? So uh, a specific question about the processes or how do you go about doing your business, right? So once the CI program is, you know, up and running, you know, then what? So what does it look like on a daily basis? Or do you have a specific recipe that you teach people how to gather intelligence, mm -hmm. how to analyze it? And mm -hmm. you, you said a lot about value, you know, how, how it adds value. Mm -hmm. How do you go about that on a daily basis? Yeah. Well, first thing in the day of a CI professional is drink coffee. And then uh, after that, well, you start looking at what, what kind? Yeah, it depends on your taste, but uh, some okay. people like it, like say latte or something like that. I prefer black coffee, and okay. no matter whether it's espresso, double espresso, or 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 even a, a filter, I don't mind. At least I have my dose of coffee uh, per per day. But uh, anyway, it's not the the most important skill for CI. I would say uh, the on daily basis. Well, uh, for me, it's a lot of common sense, and common sense to to know or to learn about competition. You have to spend time doing that so every day you have at least uh, half an hour an hour to you spend and i do that every day to look at uh, what competition is doing for each day and for the team what i created uh, it's uh, the daily uh, intelligence or intelligence of the day each day we have one piece of intelligence at least saying okay this is what we found and we follow uh, the rule of what so what no what once again, common common sense. Not go into a too, uh, uh, how to say, complex uh, uh, methods, at least uh, not in this conversation. We can, there are so many methods uh, uh, to, to, to be used for analysis. But if we go back to, uh, to, to f f fundamentals or, or fundamental principles, uh, the what is the information, so what, and now what, what we can do about that. And every day is developing the habit of gathering that intelligence, making sense of it, shape it in a digestible uh, 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 format to be consumed by people. And it's day in, day out, and it's uh, week in, week out. So at the beginning of the week, we have our weekly plan to see what kind of key intelligence topics we will deliver. And if we start with one key, key intelligence topic per week, depending on the pace, on the pace of the organization, it's fine. If, if you, you say you have minimal, minimally, you have three to five, uh, how to say, intelligence alerts, you can share with people depending on uh, how critical it is. If there is not an interest in, well, we don't need that. And uh, one, one uh, state of the competition weekly report, that can be a program for a week. But I think it's a lot about uh, forming the habits among team members to be every day aware of what competitive, uh, competitive competitors are doing. And each piece of intelligence having that uh, uh, pr process to say what what we found, okay, so what? Why is it interesting for us? And what can we do about that? Is it actionable or not? Uh, is it uh, helpful to people, even to sales or to make a deal, to marketing, to product management? Maybe it's just a feature or a usability, uh, how to say, uh, improvement that we need to do in our product. But that mindset, I, I'm not gonna go to a more complicated or more sophisticated methods because we have a lot for mm -hmm. the big picture, for side-by-side uh, -side comparisons, et cetera. But most often than not, it comes back to the, the most simple aspects of it. Uh, make sure that it makes sense for people. Make sure that you make it uh, digestible uh, for people. Otherwise, even if it's the best intelligence you have, the best insight, if it's not shaped the right way, uh, people will just not understand it. Packaging. They will disqualify it. So uh, it, from the cup of coffee onwards, looks like you said a lot of things happen, right, yeah. at the same time. So uh, so the question is, how do you go about managing your time? So the question is about time management. Do you have a strategy 
to organize once time in your in, for yourself or for your team what they recommend mm -hmm. well for, for for time management per activity let's say uh, whenever there is let's say we take a, a key intelligence topic we defined and uh, we we want to know uh, how much time we will spend from day one to uh, delivery and uh, i would say uh, it, it's it's first to understand the need uh, properly uh, uh, that that's 10 percent of your time let's say 10 uh, percent you sit with stakeholders this is really important uh, we, we don't take email requests it's more conversation kickoff to better understand what's really needed so when it's done uh, don't spend more than 30 percent of your time uh, gathering intelligence for that topic 30 uh, percent of your time well it's let's say 10 30 30 30 it, it's simple and it can it can it can uh, diff, uh, differ or uh, change from uh, one team to another but no, you, at least you take 10 percent. sorry go ahead Aaron. no no i understand what you're saying the, the ratios no it's good because i think it's important you know someone with your level of, of experience mm -hmm. and you're teaching people who actually you know are just beginning or uh, they're trying to set up or, or some are experienced mm -hmm. but on average how how much time you spend in each thing so we know oh, i shouldn't spend you know 60 percent of my time doing this or Mm -hmm. No, thank you for sharing because that's that's how people. Well, what's the benchmark? Well, about this, about this is mm -hmm. so like a 10 30 30. It, it's kind of a simple yeah. and, and people, I mean, not simple because it needs to keep it up, but yeah. it gives people an idea of uh, of uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah. And and to, to add to it, there are two points uh, why 30 for communication because before it was less, and honestly, personally, I was spending less with communication. It was between 10 and 20 percent of my time. So I was saying, OK, the intelligence is here. We analyze it. So it should be easy. But uh, uh, it, it's overlooked. And I did that mistake myself. So 30 percent of your time, you have to spend it uh, uh, in communication. It means preparing for that communication with people. When you have presentation to make, it's not just dropping uh, what you found on, on a slide and that's it. It doesn't work this way. It has to be uh how to say uh organized in such a way that people who are not competitive intelligence professionals can understand it and communicate it well when you're presenting to people etc you present it well and after that you get the feedback about that communication to make sure that the the the, the message reached uh the, the audience otherwise what's the use you present something and nobody gets uh, anything <laughs> from what we are presenting so communication side is really important so I, I think you make a great point in terms of, you know, going through the process, uh, establishing, you know, what you're doing using, you know, processes, you got the intelligence, mm -hmm. communicate clearly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I guess you always go back to the idea of the the value, right? The value you deliver, and you said that quite clearly, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have some guidance on how should we measure the CI program's performance as a whole? So how, how do you measure performance mm -hmm. for a CI team or a CIF yeah. or for the people who are looking into, well, I, should I really have a CI team or not? So how, how do you measure the performance or how can you tell this is going really well or, or not, mm -hmm. or I need to improve? Yeah. You mentioned value and it's really important. I think it's a first metric. It's value we provide, but it's tricky. It's not easy to 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 assess uh, what value we provide to the organization. But we can know uh, if, let's say, for example, for any project, the first step was uh, presentation of competitive intelligence uh, uh, to 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 the team for the project. Let's say we're working on a product roadmap, and we want to present uh, some competitive intelligence on that, uh, or 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 let's say a, a marketing campaign. And we present some competitive in the market intelligence uh, at the beginning. And after the fact, we see if the program or the campaign took into account that information. And we can link it to the success or failure of that campaign. But at least we know that uh, competitive intelligence was, in was included at the beginning and was included in that project. But it's not easier said than done because it's a lot qualitative than quantitative. But when you're starting with the program and we, you want to uh, to assess the performance of the team, well, you have uh, first uh, how to say uh, you start with volume, and volume. I mean, uh, uh, we can start easily, and it's uh, it's it has its value, uh, no, no matter what. Uh, how how many key intelligence topics do we del do do we uh, deliver? Uh, how many voice of the competition or uh, competitive briefs? How many alerts uh, and things like that? So the how many comes first because you have to build volumes and it's not for the volume it's for the habit of 
building and doing things uh, week in, week out, okay? Second is, uh, let's say, uh, impact. Uh, how many of those uh, uh, reports or presentation have been uh, included into uh, such and such pro uh, program, project, or something like that? And from what we provided as insights or recommendation, et cetera, when we see the results of those programs or projects, we say uh, uh, how many of our outputs influenced those, uh, those, uh, uh, those organizational uh, outputs, let's say. Uh, if we have, uh, as I mentioned before, a campaign, a deal, uh, product feature we want to build, etc. So uh, it, it's hard to explain it in details, like in in in, in the conversation. But link the value uh, uh, of uh, of uh, how to say link what we are doing with what is providing uh, as value for, for the organization. Start with the volume, but the volume is to create the habit of producing. It's for the team as for. Of management of the team, you know that we are working on that. And after that, uh, it's it's how what we are producing the volume is linked more and more to what other teams are doing, operations, sales, etc. That's the second step. And the third step, okay, you created the volume, you know you're producing day in, day out, you know that they are uh, uh, aware and exposed to that competitive intelligence recommendations, insight, etc. The third step is to say, how that intelligence shaped or influenced and that's why we were, we were talking about influence how it was uh, a, an influence element or influential to the decision making and this about uh, it's a lot about discussion with stakeholders and being involved in the decision process to understand what has been done and how we influence that if it can help so in the book, you also talk about building lean CI programs. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? What is a lean CI program? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a program allowing us to do more or to provide more by doing less. Uh, because uh, the temptation, let's say you have 10 products, the temptation is start to cover the 10 products and to work on, 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 on whatever you can work on. And it's not possible in my experience. Uh, it has to be, let's say, uh, well, you create your uh, uh, following the principles of, of Lean, and I invite everyone to 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 to, to get uh, interested in in the Lean uh, principles, etc. But uh, it's it's a lot about the value, and it's a lot about the flow. And the flow, how you create it, it's with tools like Kanban, where where uh, you you make sure that uh, any any item is not getting stuck. Uh, in any phase of the, of your work, let's say you have your funnel backlog, the work ongoing, the work what uh, which is ready, and uh, the work that has been done, and in each step you want to make sure that it's flowing from one step to another, uh, for any key intelligence topic. So when I'm talking about lean, for example, to start working on something, we have to prioritize it first, and uh, I can tell you we always have this conversation with the team with team members to make sure that any item that we start working on has the highest priority for the organization. Uh, and it's not just urgent because urgent can be a very tricky. The best place to be when you prioritize and when it's important and not urgent. Uh, when it's urgent, you like it or not, at some point you, you, you are tempted to cut corners and just to deliver something and it's not good for, for business. So yeah you ensure that you're working on the highest value for the organization, uh, business value or, or uh, customer value by prioritizing and all across the, uh, let's say what we call Kanban. And I invite everyone to get interested in that because it's really powerful. Yeah, it's really powerful. You make sure that the time you're spending in each step and bottlenecks, let's say, if you have to have input from a subject matter expert and the person is taking uh, a week a holiday per month, okay, for some reason. And you can get that person to have a conversation with you and you have a presentation. So the whole process or the whole delivery time, uh, you, you have to add that time. You have to consider the, the holidays time of that person. And it can delay the, uh, the, uh, the delivery of your key IT or key intelligence topic. So you have to consider that. When you are working uh, correctly with the Kanban and tools like that, you consider this kind of bottlenecks to make sure that if you commit to two weeks to deliver a key IT, 
Uh, you consider everything in that and you calculate that over time. You know, for a KIT, for example, you're taking three, three weeks. So if someone asks you to do it in one week, you can just say it's not realistic. It's not going to happen because we know that it take, takes us three weeks, not because we are lazy and we okay. wait to the last 48 hours, but because you have other stakeholders and different steps that we know by experience because we have our Kanban, we can't do in one week. So this kind of situations, Lean can really help with that and uh, make sure that, uh, uh, yeah, we, we are working on the most important things. And uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot to say on that. It's, it's really a good topic. Well, so along the same lines, so all through the show, you talked a lot about influence or influencing, right? So what is, and you talk about communications, right? So what is the importance of developing communications and influencing skills for the CI professional? Mm -hmm. What I saw in my experience most of the time, we gather intelligence well, we analyze well, we uh, uh, communicated uh, not so well. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a lot about how, how, how to say. Uh, and I learned that from uh, communication, uh, two rules in communication, have something good to say and say it well. So the first part, I think we're good at, we have something good to say because we have the content, the substance, but how we convey the message, how we position ourselves in the organization. And even when we're presenting, we have the floor, we have the platform. And then it's like just showing facts and people can just see the documents. Sometimes they don't want even to attend to presentation because it's kind of, uh, well, let's say it. sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's not, uh, 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 we lost we we lose them sometimes uh, because there's too much content uh, the story is not there when i say story it's the beginning to the end let's say start start by defining describing and demonstrating not starting directly to uh, bits and bytes things like that for communication that's just the first part influence is uh, developing the, the, those uh, people skills to make sure that uh, we're not for example antagonizing anyone just because we disagree with the person. We know who are the stakeholders and you have the Mandelo matrix, which can help a lot with that. I was mentioning before, the organization is not a hierarchy, it's a network of people and you have people more connected than others. We have to understand those connections uh, because even, even if we present something about the computer talking about a feature, maybe uh, how to say, it's not good news for uh, some folks. Uh, 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 inside the organization. And we, we have to be careful about that. Uh, and and uh, how to say, for, for your stakeholders, they have their interest and they have their influence also or power. And there are different ways to, 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 to deal or to collaborate with those people. For some stakeholders, you just need to keep them informed. Others, you keep them satisfied. Others, you have to monitor closely and others you have to work closely with because they will be promoters for uh, CI and things like that. So it's not just even about communication, it's beyond that. Who's who in the organization, uh, what's their interest in CI and more, uh, more than that. It's, it's that, that uh, so type, uh, people skill that we need to develop. And uh, I think even in influence, it's the confidence, the confidence as CI professionals, because we have so much knowledge. I think we know most of the time more than anyone else in the organization. But still, when it comes to presenting it, we are like hesitant and things like that, and people see it. And when they see it, it's not, it's not good for your credibility. So yeah, this is maybe uh, uh, building that confidence uh, and, and it can be learned, uh, it can be learned. So uh, I, I really believe that even influence and having the, uh, the tools for that are plenty of tools, but we have to get interested in, in being uh, better communicators and influencers not in the sense, let's say, social media and things like that, but more uh, gray eminences inside the organization. Eminence grace. Yeah. So I think, so this is uh, really the reason why I wanted to bring you to talk about your book today. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the first time we talked was, you know, about work stuff. Uh, but uh, I could see in your book, I mean, in engaging with you, that you do have that specific quality you are a very good communicator. You actually you certainly have something to say. 
but you know how to say it. You're very clear. And that the audience is really liking. I have, you know, uh, Marjolaine here says, I want to share. I found this book gives me the best practice to manage and communicate any expertise knowledge. Not only good for CI knowledge, I learn a lot on how to give our knowledge the proper vehicle to get to stakeholders. So I think this is the, the audience sees that, you know, uh, the reader sees that. I have another one, you know, from, from Mary here saying, wonderful interview. I will read your book. So it's, it's oh. captivating. I think you do a, a great mm -hmm. job of uh, uh, communicating and, you know, first organizing your thoughts uh, in, in a way that is academic. It's informative, but it's not boring. I mean, if you're boring, I probably wouldn't be talking to you because I well, think I'm boring enough. <laughs> enough of boring people. So let's thanks not bring boring people to talk to anyone. So um, thank you. I think you do such a such, such a, a wonderful job. And um, I did save a question for last because Kai fired another one. And uh, mm -hmm. really, uh, so uh, uh, sorry, one I've question. Been... This one, we saw it. Yeah, we saw that one. Oh, so uh, what would you personally consider to be a really interesting CI question or problem for people to tackle? I think, honestly, I will be uh, knowing our own organization. That's the first and most important problem to tackle. Before knowing the competition or learning about the competition. And when I, when I say that, uh, what can make a competition uh, beat us is us, not them. And there is a, a proverb for that. When there is no, no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. And I think really, the, and this is, maybe you can ask people <laughs> who I work with. I always say, we need to know ourselves. Uh, uh, master everything about ourselves, our products, our processes, our uh, uh, customer uh, satisfaction or frustration, everything, everything. And then we can go to know about uh, uh, competitors and we can have a real uh, accurate comparison. Because if we just go, let's say, go to competitors' reviews and say, hey, they are bad, they are not doing, their app is uh, not good, etc. Well, if we didn't see our app, I mean, sometimes it's, it's so for me, it's just an example, but really I believe that we need to know our organization, our people, our products and everything around it uh, better than anyone else inside our own organization. To that sense, I think I would say uh, uh, we, we, we are, uh, I would say, yeah, well positioned to be the gray eminences with that knowledge that we develop. And we, ha we have to build it not just be interested in it, document it. Wherever you have a conversation with people, etc., about products, etc., okay, the, put it somewhere because you will use it when you compare the, our product with competitors' products or process or anything. So, yeah, uh, I hope it helps. It certainly does. Well, you know, thank you so very much for being here. You know, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Shukran, Lea Ruduka. <laughs> uh, merci, merci, and thank you. Thank you, Ram, uh, for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to have the conversation with you. And uh, I return the, the compliment because I think you're doing a, a, a great job, honestly. Uh, keeping keeping that conversation around competitive intelligence and other topics with the magazine, with this uh, platform, uh, I'm, I'm sure in the future there will be uh, more and more uh, people interested in, in what we are sharing here and what you are building here. So I wish you, uh, not I wish you, I know you will have a lot of success in that. So thanks again. Thank you so very much. It's it's wonderful as always uh, to talk with you. So uh, before we go, uh, let me uh, switch back because uh, you know, folks, uh, let's uh, take a look. So the competitive intelligence playbook, how to build, manage and optimize a competitive intelligence program by Fuad ben -Yub. and it is indeed available on Amazon.com. So please uh, go visit uh, Amazon and take a look if you have not gotten your copy yet. Still in time uh, to get the Competitive Intelligence Playbook 
And again, Fouad, thank you so very much for uh, taking uh, time of your day to be with uh, me and the guests today. My pleasure, Ram. And I thank hope. you, everyone, for attending. And I hope to see you soon. Yeah, same here. Thank Hopefully. you. Hopefully. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, go back to the agenda for a moment. So there we are. So we uh, spoke with Fouad. Uh, I just checked to make sure uh, there are uh, no other uh, comments or questions uh, in there. Uh, we, I think we addressed all of the, the questions. Uh, but if you are watching us on a recorded event or as a podcast, you too can be part of the conversation. Please make sure you just go to our uh, YouTube page and leave your comments, leave more comments, leave more questions. I know where Fouad is. And I think Mahesh is on his way to Malaga. He's probably on the way to airport. Uh, but we can um, we can talk to him and I can certainly follow up and make sure you know your questions are delivered. And they, they have great turnaround, so they will uh, provide an answer as soon as possible. So I want to talk a little bit about the upcoming events. So what's up and coming? So on the third, uh, well, we'll welcome uh, several uh, good friends. So Jamie Burns and Karen Walker from ASU, Dr. Aslam from Palo Alto Networks, and Dr. Huang from um, Stanford. We're going to be talking about uh, the university cooperation partnerships uh, how to make them work, uh, how to get the best out of them. On December the 9th, it's going to be Sci-Fi Day. I'm going to welcome Dr. Tom Lombardo. He's going to be discussing this. He's got two new books, and he's the resident expert on sci-fi things. So how to use sci-fi to accomplish your business goals, right? On December the 17th, I will welcome Mexican futurist Alicia Baena. She's going to talk to us about you know, the latest that she's doing. And after that, I will be welcoming Dr. Stefan Bergheim, who is the lead researcher at the ZGF Institute in Frankfurt. Uh, he's wonderful. I love talking with him. Always uh, so much stuff, so much to learn. And then uh, we will continue our talk on technology. So uh, I know we talked about, you know, digitalization. So the metaverse, sustainability, and et cetera. Those are recurring themes and topics and things that you guys want to hear. So if you have other topics or comments or suggestions or tell me what you'd like to talk about or what you'd like to hear, please uh, uh, just reach out and let me know. I will be welcoming uh, Joyce Joya. She's the author of the Herman uh, newsletter, a fantastic read as well. And Markets and Markets has several uh, new upcoming events. Uh, they are roundtables and they seem to be uh, very interesting. So we'll be covering those as well. So I guess it's time uh, for us uh, to kind of say our goodbyes. I want again to thank you so very much for your presence and participation on the show today. I think that's the reason why I'm here. That's the reason why the guests are here. They want to talk to you. They want to hear your thoughts. Uh, they want to know what excites you. And of course, we want to know what else we want to talk about because you know what topics are interesting, right? You can certainly and always reach out to the magazine or to me, the host, via Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and of course, uh, via YouTube. I hope to see you soon on one of our next shows. And I'm going to leave you with our institutional message. Again, thank you so very much for attending the show today.